Hi everyone, welcome to the Richie Flow podcast. Today my guest is Stephanie Seneff. Stephanie is a senior research scientist at MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Since 2010, her research has focused on the effects of drugs, toxic chemicals, and diet on human health and disease. She has written and spoken extensively, authoring over three dozen peer-reviewed journal articles on topics related to human disease, nutrition, and toxic exposures. She has specifically focused on the herbicide glyphosate, the primary ingredient in Roundup and other commercially used pesticides. She has also researched deeply into the autism epidemic, statin drugs, as well as the mineral sulfur. I had a wonderful conversation with Stephanie. She's um, unbelievably well-versed in so many ad- aspects of human health and disease, uh, particularly how they relate to glyphosate exposure. Uh, in the podcast, we focused uh, on how glyphosate can cause system-wide problems for human health. Um, we also touched on the importance of sulfur uh, in human biology and how it pertains to the water that fills our cells. Uh, We also talked about practical tips to reduce exposure and hopefully we painted a clear picture of why it's so important to support organic and particularly regenerative agriculture uh, for our future. So with all that being said, I hope you enjoy the podcast. Thanks so much for coming on today to talk to me, Stephanie. Um, You've got... uh, quite a background um it seems like everywhere i go in the health space um everyone's talking about you um oh, wow. <laughs> you've, you've contributed so much uh, and everyone's very grateful for the work that you've done on glyphosate and um sulfur but you've got four degrees from mit um is that is that correct it is yes yeah so how did you end up in in this space researching you know pesticides and and things like this yeah, I mean, it, I, my, my career, for the most part, involved writing computer code and developing systems that allowed computers to communicate with humans us- using natural speech. And then for a period of time, I also worked on developing computer games using speech to help people learn a second language, and particularly English-speaking people learning Chinese. So I had a lot of fun with both of those topics. And those, um, the... Uh, you know, there's Amazon Echo and, and Siri, the iPhone Siri, is representative of what we were doing way back when. But once the um, industry kind of took over and it became a marketable topic, it wasn't really easy for academic missions to carry on because you have these huge, you know, numbers of people in the company working on the same thing you're working on and you really can't, uh, you can't stay ahead of them anymore once it's, once it's become, you know, industrialized, so to speak, commoditized. Mm-hmm. So, so that was happening around 2006, 2007 timeframe. And at the same time, I was noticing autism rates going up and really concerned about it. Um, and I, I had a personal friend who had had a child with, who had severe autism. So it was kind of a, something I knew personally. And um, I felt like they weren't finding the answer. You know, the research was direction was towards genetics and there is a genetic component, but I knew there had to be something in the environment that was driving the rates up and I wanted to figure out what it was. And and I didn't think of glyphosate. It took me five years before I discovered glyphosate accidentally. Of course, like everybody else, glyphosate is safe. I didn't think to look at it as a possible contributor. Um, But I happened to hear a a presentation by Professor Don Huber, um, 2012 in in the fall, two hour presentation on glyphosate. And I'm embarrassed to admit that I didn't know what glyphosate was when I walked into the room. Um, I quickly found out it was Roundup. And of course I knew what Roundup was and I've never used it because I don't like to use toxic chemicals on my lawn and I have children. Um, but he started talking about all the things that glyphosate does uh, you know, to the, to the microbes, to the gut microbes, the, the uh, chelation of the minerals and, um, and disruption of the uh, gut microbiome and um, things that I knew were, were problematic in autism. I was looking for things like antibiotics, too many antibiotics. I knew there was something going on with the gut. So it kind of like, he, it fit like hand in glove. The, the things I had been learning about aut- autism matched extremely well with the things he was saying about glyphosate. And so I walked away with an epiphany from that experience. And I just basically dropped everything else and started learning everything I could about glyphosate. And the more I looked, the more it became clear to me that not only is it the cause of the autism epidemic, but it's also the cause of the epidemic and a great number of other diseases that are going up dramatically. It's not the only cause, you know, we have so many chemicals, but I think it's primary. 
for many diseases like diabetes and obesity, fatty liver disease, um, gut problems, of course, you know, inflammatory gut, um, various cancers like pancreatic cancer, thyroid cancer, Alzheimer's, autism, ADHD. There's a long list of diseases that are going up dramatically exactly in step with the rise in glyphosate usage on core crops. And we haven't figured out that connection, it, which is surprising to me because when you look and you see and you, and you know to look, it becomes very obvious to you. And then, of course, I was interested in the mechanism. And so uh, I, I am a naturally a curious person and I like to, I love biology and I like puzzles. And so this is kind of like a huge biological puzzle that I got myself into and really get quite obsessed with, with reading the papers, trying to piece together the story. And, uh, and I feel quite confident now that I'm right, um, that glyphosate is the primary factor in all these diseases and also in the die off of a great number of species that are under siege right now. We have the monarch butterfly and the, 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 the bee colony collapse syndrome and um, frogs are disappearing. 41% of the species of frogs are, are threatened with extinction. And, and the, all the you know, bugs no longer fill up your windshield when you're driving at night. I mean, it's very, very clear that something awful is going on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we don't seem to be willing to acknowledge it. The government certainly doesn't seem to be willing to acknowledge it. Yeah, well, you've just um, you've mentioned a whole lot of things that um, seem to be connected with increasing glyphosate use. It, it seems crazy that one molecule can do so much. Uh, and I think that's one of the problems is that it's doing, it's going everywhere because it's water soluble and it's got, as you forwarded this um, glycine substitution problem, um, which when I first heard you talk about it, I thought that there was a chance that any glycine residue could be substituted. But in, in the book, you, you talk about there being a, a more um, complex way that glyphosate substitutes for glycine and uh, if that's right the implications are not just in one disease or or one one part of the body it's everywhere and there's not much you can really do about it um, right yeah can you talk it's, a little bit more about the how it's substituting for glycine yes this is the thing that um you know anthony samsel and i collaborated on a number of papers and he suggested this to me in december i think of 2015 I had been kind of toying with the idea maybe that was happening and I had kind of dismissed it because I thought, well, it's got this extra stuff on its nitrogen atom. It probably won't, won't work, you know, was my immediate, immediate thought. And I think that's what the chemists are thinking too. They're saying, no, it can't happen. Forget that. And they won't think any further. But once Anthony kind of teased me and said, yeah, you should take a look. And then I started looking hard and I can remember that December I was here in Kauai where I am now. And I just poured over all these glycine papers and finding glycine mutations that were causing diseases that are going up exactly the step with glyphosate, I started to think, holy cow, this really works, you know? It, it all, all the pieces, those pieces really came together very quickly over that period, very fruitful period of a couple of months. And we wrote a paper together. That was the first paper that I wrote on the topic of the idea that glyphosate might be substituting for glycine during protein synthesis. So let me tell you a little bit more about this, the, the biology of it. It's quite interesting. Um, glyphosate is an amino acid, and uh, the, there are about 20 amino acids that are the building blocks of proteins. They're, they're super, super important in the body because the proteins are the workhorses. They're the, the enzymes, the transporters, the ion channels, the receptors, they're structural proteins. I mean, they really are almost the most important thing in, in living species is the proteins, which are made, assembled according to the DNA code. So the genetics is what's dictating how your proteins look. And the proteins have about 20 different amino acids in them. And they're lined up like beads on a string, according to the code. And one of those 20 is glycine. Glycine is the smallest amino acid, no side chains. And then the way that it detects that it's glycine is because it fits very snugly into this pocket and all the other amino acids are too big. And it turns out that glyphosate is also the same, no side chains. So it also fits in that pocket perfectly because it is a complete glycine molecule. The difference is that it has extra material stuck on its nitrogen atom, which is outside of the pocket, because the nitrogen atom has to hook up in the paper with the paper dolls. You know, they're all joining hands. The nitrogen is outside of the socket, ready to hook up, and the glyphosate fits beautifully in there. And as long as there's room for the extra material, it can go in. And in certain situations, I think it's going to be attra attracted 
to the extent that it could be more likely to go in than glycine would at the same place, just because of the particular situation in the context of that particular protein. So I talked about that in the book. It's really quite fascinating because I, I called it sort of a glyphosate susceptibility motif that I defined. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I could identify which proteins match that motif. And then you find the protein, you say, well, does this link to one of the diseases? Oh, sure, it does. Here's your yeah. fatty liver disease. So it's quite fun, too. Uh, I'm still playing that game because it's a huge space. And I still find new proteins that are um, potentially affected by glyphosate and that then link to diseases. I haven't finished that yet. It's just such a huge task. And then, you know, hard to remember all of them. But I, I certainly singled out a number of them in the book. Yeah. And, and it becomes very clear to me. Um, the, when you see what's glyph what glyphosate is doing and, and you can observe experimentally which, which, which proteins it suppresses, they know there's a number of different proteins that get suppressed by glyphosate. And they usually, they fit very well with my motif. So it's quite exciting that way. The whole puzzle um, comes together very nicely. Yeah. I mean, you've talked about the paper that uh, Anthony Samsel found from Monsanto with the bluegill sunfish. Yes, um, yes. How how everyone doesn't accept that it's substituting for glycine after that, I don't know. I know. Um, but can you can you talk talk through that right. study a little bit? That was quite amazing because it was bluegill sunfish and they were curious to find out where the glyphosate was accumulating in the tissue. It's a very important question to answer. They're doing all these studies on and this is early data, like 1980s, uh, you know, part of the process of determining if glyphosate is safe. And they say so they fed these bluegill sunfish, they exposed them to radio labels glyphosate, which allowed them to trace the radio label independently of the glyphosate. And then they looked in the tissues and sure enough, there was the radio label in the tissues, pretty much all the tissue samples they looked at had radio label. And then they said, well, let's just do the standard measure for glyphosate and see how much is there according to that. And it was only about 20% of the radio label that could be accounted for as glyphosate. So now the label's there, but it's not glyphosate. So what is it? And they got the brilliant idea of digesting the protein. So they basically added enzymes that break proteins down into individual amino acids. And after they did that, they were able to increase the yield to 70%. 70% 70 of the, of the um, radio label could be explained as glyphosate once they broke down the proteins into individual amino acids. And they wrote, perhaps the uh, glyphosate was being incorporated into the protein. This is their words, which is exactly what we're saying. So I feel like they knew. I feel like maybe the people at Bayer, at Monsanto, know that this is happening even today. I, I can't prove it, and they're not going to admit it, so we're kind yeah. of in a deadlock there. But I just can't, kind of can't believe they don't know it. And, of course, they're trying to say, no, it's impossible, forget this, she's crazy, I mean, that kind of thing. So they want to make you know infinite deniability, because if it's true, it's game over for glyphosate. There's no question. Yeah. Um so do you think that it, there's a chance that um, glyphosate is substituting within um, the collagen throughout the body in the extracellular matrix? I do. I think it's really an obvious place where glyphosate is going to substitute just because there are so many glycines there. Yeah. Collagen is amazing. It's a beautiful molecule. It has this beautiful triple helix structure that it forms. And in order to do that, it depends on this sequence, this spe specific sequence that it has of GXY, 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 where every third amino acid is a glycine, because glycine is tiny. So it needs tiny to be able to kind of sew those helices together to make that beautiful triple helix. And that structure is extremely important for the function of that protein. It's a structural protein. It has good tensile strength. It absorbs water. You know, it has flexibility. It, it basically makes your joints and your bones work well. And when you start throwing glyphosate in there in various spots in place of those glycines, the triple helix is going to fall apart. And then the molecule is not going to have the proper properties to be able to do its job. And we have today a huge problem with, you know, hip replacement, knee replacement therapy, uh, foot problems, back, backache, you know, all, all kinds of problems with, um, with our joints and our bones. And I think that it's connected to this um, substitution of glyphosate in collagen. Yeah. Well, when I, when I'm thinking collagen, I I automatically think it's its ability to structure water and to create that that gelled water all the way throughout the body. And and um, you're a fan of Gerald Pollack probably as much, if not more, than I am. Yes. <laughs> um, I'd love to get into your thoughts about um, the role of of structured water. And I mean, one of Pollack's um, papers showed that glyphosate reduces the EZ yes. in the water. Um, I remember that. That's amazing, have, right? Yeah. I mean, if you have a, a toxin that has the ability to 
break the water in the body, uh, the the possibility of that to cause um, so many problems is huge. So, you know, what, what's your view on on the, the role of structured water in the body as it relates to glyphosate? Yeah, I think the structured water is absolutely amazing, all the things that it does for you, and particularly, for example, lining the blood vessels. You know, we have, and I talk a lot about the heparin sulfate proteoglycans that um, are linked to the uh, extracellular matrix of the of the all the cells, but in particular the cells, the endothelial cells lining the blood vessels, they have this heparin sulfate that heavily populated with heparin sulfate. The sulfate is important because, and I talk a lot in my book about how glyphosate messes up the sulfate supply. I think that's a crucial part of its uh, toxic toxicology. And um, heparin, the sulfate also is very good at binding. Uh, heparin sulfate attaches to collagen, first of all, and it's very good at um, at holding structured water, maintaining and growing structured water. And so um, when there's not enough sulfate in that extracellular, in, in the lining the uh, blood vessel, when there's not enough sulfate, then you start, your red blood cells can't easily slip through the capillary. Because if you picture a capillary and you think jello lining all the walls of the capillary and the red blood cell barely fits inside the capillary, you know, it's very tiny. So it has to have a very slick, uh, surface to be able to kind of slide through like going on a slide to reduce the tent you know the um the friction because if there's a lot of friction the heart's gonna have to pump a lot harder to get the red blood cell to go through maybe it'll get stuck so there's it's really really important to have that uh gelled water lining the vessel and then the red blood cell is in the fluid water that's in the internal part of you know the actual blood that's flowing through and it can flow through very easily it doesn't get all tangled up in all the cells all the molecules that are sticking along the surface, they're all buried inside that structured water. So a very smooth surface. Otherwise you don't, if there's not enough sulfate, you don't. And then the red blood cell gets stuck. And, and it's also important in the membrane of the red blood cell. The red blood cell carries cholesterol sulfate in its membrane, which is very interesting because that's providing the negative charge that repels the red blood cells from each other, just like magnets. So they stay separated. If they don't have enough negative charge, first of all, they could stick together and secondly, there isn't enough power to push them through because that negative charge is actually working to help the circulation actually flow because the blood is like a battery. There's like a, there's a voltage drop between the artery and the vein. And when the red blood cell is traveling through the capillary, it's attracted like, like you would be, uh, like a magnet would be attracted. It's attracted to the venous side. So it wants to get through, it's pulled in through that charge. If it has more charge, it's gonna pull faster. It's a very simple you know, equation there. So when the red blood cell doesn't have enough negative charge, because it doesn't have enough cholesterol sulfate, it can't flow. Again, that's going to disrupt the flow. So you basically have really big circulation problems with these, these two uh, issues related to sulfate in two very different ways. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting that you talk so much about sulfur because I'm, I'm in my fourth year of research on uh, fourth year of study on in dietetics and I have heard sulfur zero times in in those four years so why do you think it is that um, or even though sulfur is so important um, in biology that it's just not talked about um, particularly in in terms of, of food you know we don't we don't um, measure how much sulfur is in food or anything like that uh, how has sulfur slipped through the cracks? I wish I understood that because to me, it became very clear. Actually, when I first started researching autism and I was also researching heart disease at the same time, mm -hmm. and I identified sulfate in particular as being an important um, issue, insufficient sulfate as being an important issue in both heart disease and autism before I even met glyphosate. I already figured that out. And I was really surprised at the lack of interest, a lack of interest in heparin sulfate, lack of interest in cholesterol sulfate, vitamin D sulfate, you know, all these, and there's all these sulfated molecules that are, um, all these biologically active molecules that are sulfated in transit. And they understand that sulfation temporarily disables its ability to do its biological thing. So it sort of turns it off and they figure, well, that's why it's sulfated so that when it's traveling in the blood, it doesn't want to be active until it arrives. It drops off the sulfate and then it becomes active. Vitamin D is like that. And cholesterol sulfate is like that too. So they, but if you think about it, those molecules are transporting sulfate all over the body. And you need a molecule to transport sulfate because otherwise sulfate will gel the blood. You don't want gelled blood. You know, you need the gel lining the vessel, but you don't want it in the part that's going to flow. Very tricky system. 
to figure out. And so the cholesterol and the sulfate both help each other out. Cholesterol is not water soluble by itself. If you stick a sulfate onto it, then it becomes water sulfate soluble and it can just be shipped right out into the blood without having to be packaged up inside an LDL particle. So, you know, we have all these people taking statin drugs because they have high serum LDL. And the reason I think why they have high serum LDL is because they don't have enough sulfate. And in fact, cholesterol sulfate goes into membrane. So it gets out into the, it can go freely into the blood and then it can, it'll pop into the membrane. The, the, the uh, lipid part, you know, that's uh, not water soluble goes naturally into membranes and the sulfate sticking out and the sulfate's making gel around the lipid particle. So what's happening is that LDL particle is becoming very protected by the cholesterol sulfate that goes into its membrane. It makes gel around that particle and that gel is called exclusion zone water for a reason, because it excludes things. It becomes like pure crystalline water around the LDL particle that keeps it safe from getting from reacting with things that are in the blood that are dangerous, like glucose, for example, you know, and oxidizing agents. Those things have less access to the, to the contents, the fatty contents inside the LDL particle if the particle has enough cholesterol sulfate in its membrane. So again, if you have deficiency of cholesterol sulfate, those LDL particles become susceptible to damage. When they get oxidized, when they get glycated, they become problematic and you get heart disease. And then you're going to be stuck with a statin drug because that's what they're going to do. They're going to say, oh, you have a high LDL, take a statin drug. Rather than recognizing your real problem is you don't have enough sulfate. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you wrote a, a beautiful paper about Enos um, mm-hmm. and its, its role in um, sulf- uh, sulfate um, creating sulfate. Um, can you talk a little bit about glyphosate and ENOS? Oh gosh. Yeah. ENOS I think is one of those molecules that's very, very sensitive to glyphosate toxicity. Yeah. In fact, it's been shown experimentally that glyphosate disrupts a class of enzymes called cytochrome P450 enzymes. And, and ENOS is called an orphan member of that class because it's not quite it's not quite exactly the same, but it has a lot of the same features. And I suspect that it disrupts ENOS in the same way as it disrupts the other side enzymes. ENOS also depends upon terminal glycines in order to hook to the membrane. It has a highly conserved glycine at the end that allows it to hook to the membrane. And it needs to hook to the membrane in order to make the sulfate, in my opinion. And so it can't hook because the glyphosate is substituting for the glycine. That's going to cause it to not be able to do its job properly. It even also has two glycines that are, um, are necessary to hook, to make a dimer, to make an ENOS dimer. Absolutely. So these highly conserved glycine residues in ENOS, I suspect, are getting disrupted by glyphosate and it's interfering with its ability to make the sulfate that is, then goes into the heparin sulfate in the membranes of all the cells. And of course, the blood vessels as well. Yeah, right. So it seems it seems like glyphosate's involved in in a lot of these different processes that uh, involve both um, sulfur metabolism and water. Um, I was just uh, wondering. Um, I've heard um, Gregory Nye uh, mm-hmm. talk about um, low sulfur diets, uh, and he said he had. Um, Yes. Spoken to you, you know, what, what's going on where we can't tolerate sulfur or some, some people um, have abhorrent sulfur metabolism. Right. And so that's really interesting. Cause I had people, I, when I was, I started, and I, you know, in the early days I was saying, oh, you got to eat a high sulfur diet. And I was kind of broadcasting that message and I would get email from people. I can't eat sulfur. You know, mm-hmm. I can't eat garlic. They're like, I get sick. And so I, that made me step back and think, oh my God, what's going on there? You know, so it was something that I learned about early on. There were people who had sulfur sensitivities and I started reading about it and I found out about, for example, sulfite oxidase. Sulfite oxidase is a very important enzyme in the gut that uh, converts sulfite into sulfate. And sulfite oxidase, I suspect, is one of those enzymes that's getting disrupted by glyphosate. And um, so then the sulfite, if, if sulfite oxidase isn't working, Sulfite becomes uh, very toxic because it's highly reactive and sulfate becomes deficient. And this is happening in the gut. Um, and so I, um, there's a, I guess in my, in my book, I write about the various enzymes, the, even the enzyme that activates the sulfate, for example, it turns sulfate into something called PAPS, phosphoadenosyl, phosphosulfate, I think, PAPS. It's a PAPS synthase enzyme. 
And that enzyme has critical um, glycine dependencies. You know, there's a, there's a glycine mo motif that fits extremely well with my glyphosate susceptibility model. And so I'm suspecting it, it binds to ATP molecules and proteins that bind to ATP molecules have this sequence of so GXGXXG motif that I suspect is highly sensitive to glyphosate. Also, they have the, you know, the, the, I have the complicated story about this negative charge. You've read about it in the book, but PAP synthase matches it very well. And PAP synthase is essential for converting sulfate into an activated form of sulfate. It's kind of a blend of an ATP molecule with sulfate. It binds to two ATP molecules and uses one of them for energy and uses the other one as a substrate to make PAPs. So it's going to consume two ATP molecules, but it has tremendous potential, I think, for glyphosate disruption because of that. And, um, and if PAP synthase can't work, then everything that involves moving sulfate from one molecule to another is broken because it, it, sulfate doesn't move unless it gets converted into this activated form of sulfate. That's the only way you can actually transfer it to, um, to another molecule. So to, to take a sulfate off of cholesterol and put it onto heparin to make heparin sulfate. You can't do that without PEP synthase. Right, right. That's that's really really interesting because I, you know, I hadn't heard so much about um, sulfur intolerance until then. So it's it's a the story gets more and more complex. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to backtrack a little bit. Uh, I I had recently read uh, Carrie Gillum's uh, book. Mm -hmm. And um, at the start of the book, she also talks about AMPA, which is the, the mm -hmm. breakdown, breakdown product. product. Um, I was wondering if you had done any research on the toxicity of AMPA, because even when glyphosate breaks down, are the, are the, are the breakdown products any safer than glyphosate itself? Yeah, AMPA is also toxic. Um, and it's not an amino acid, so it's not toxic in that way. And actually, I probably should have spent more time studying AMPA's toxicity because I don't actually know exactly how it how it causes damage. It's very different from glyphosate because it doesn't have any of those glycine analog properties. Um, I think Anthony Samso was suspecting that it would substitute for taurine in, if I'm getting this right, in um, in the bile acids, which would be one way that it would disrupt. Uh, the bile acids, taurine is a, a, taurine is a sulfur containing amino acid. And he was of the opinion that AMPA, AMPA would be a taurine analog. Now, I don't know enough chemistry to know if that's true or not. So <laughs> glyphosate has this beautiful story because it's an amino acid and that makes sense. And you can go right through, you can find the research literature to find the specific glycine residues and what happens if they're replaced by something, by an amino acid that looks a lot like glyphosate. So you can actually find exact matches, you know, to simulate what would happen if you put glyphosate there. AMPA is a little harder to figure out because I don't have that same kind of uh, opportunity to, um, to build the model. Yeah. So, I, yeah, but I know it's supposed to be very toxic and, and people think it's equally toxic as glyphosate. I would think that it isn't in the sense that it doesn't have that amino acid property, which is really, really deadly. And right. it's, it's insidious and cumulative, which makes it, you know, that much worse. Do you know, um, I, I've heard of several practitioners talking about using glycine therapeutically to sort of um, block out the effects of, of glyphosate. Um, how much, how much um, research, if any, has been, has been done on the efficacy of that? I know a lot of people who have said to me, and especially, you know, um, naturopaths, they have said they, they have, have a lot of success with having their patients take glycine as a supplement. And I would certainly encourage people to eat foods that are rich in glycine. In fact, bone broth is a really, uh, you know, again, organic, you know, grass-fed beef bone broth, uh, very nutritious because it has the minerals as well, but it has a lot of glycine in it. And so um, that, because it has collagen, it's actually the collagen that's giving you the glycine. And of course, collagen is also very popular. A lot of people are taking collagen or taking gelatin. You see those in the health food store, right? Those are all going to be very high glycine uh, nutrients. And I think it probably is a very good idea to keep your glycine levels high in the face of glyphosate, because it will hopefully outcompete it and you'll have fewer glyphosate molecules getting into your proteins if your glycine is, is sufficient, is abundant even. Do you think there's a potential contamination issue if you're not watching? I know. I would definitely because... not want to take glycine that's not organic. And I imagine people are doing that. 
Well, I, I, a lot of the collagen I see is from um, uh, like fish sources or, or mm. from, from the ocean, which is which makes me very concerned. Um, you know, I, like you, I, I prefer to make my own broth with mm-hmm. some biodynamic bones. Um, right. Do you, so do you, do you think that um, there would, will be studies in the future looking at these collagen supplements and going, well, yeah, they're actually pretty full of, glyphosate residue. Yes. Uh, well, in fact, Anthony Samso, we have a paper. This was our sixth paper together, I think, where we reported on. He, the Anthony is, is fun because he actually gets things and, subs- and, and tests them for glyphosate. And he even knows how to prepare them, you know, with the enzymes and, and the hydrochloric acid that will break down the proteins into individual amino acids so that you'll be able to see the glyphosate that's in the protein. And he's been testing all kinds of interesting uh, things, both food sources and he, he got a bone from a, a CAFO cow bone from a butcher, so a, a confined animal feeding operation. He wanted to get a, <laughs> the butcher was quite confused and he wanted to make sure that this was not a, you know, not a healthy bone. <laughs> and, so, and, he, uh, and he tested it and found glyphosate in there after he had processed it. He, he, he got collagen, he got uh, jello actually, jello gelatin. He found glyphosate in all of those. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's it's it, it's working, and he also found it in breast tissue from someone with breast cancer. He found it in um, bile acids. He found it in horses' hooves from a horse that had um, founder. So it was because the hoof, you know, the horse's hoof has tons of collagen, and uh, founder is a condition that the horses are suffering from these days. And he thinks it's due to the glyphosate contamination in the hoof, and wow. in fingernails, in hair. He's found it in baby teeth. He's found it in all of those. He's been, uh, I've been pressuring him to get this written up and publish it. He's, he's yeah. so busy with his uh, studies. I think he has a hard time taking a break long enough to write it up, but he keeps promising to to publish all of this, these results. We have some results published in the paper that I mentioned. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Six, yeah. Um, I wanted to, you mentioned diabetes um, before mm-hmm. and, and um, the problem with uh, insufficient sulfate um, generating cholesterol sulfate. Uh, leading to elevated LDL. Um, could you maybe expand a little bit more about how you think glyphosate might be um, contributing to the diabetes epidemic? Yeah, diabetes is actually um, quite complex. And of course, it has to do with the, um, well, one thing is insulin actually has glycine residues in it. So insulin could be getting messed up by glyphosate. Um, the receptors, um, there's a, a very big problems with mitochondria. Uh, and I wrote a lot about that in my book. Glyphosate messes up many enzymes that are crucial for mitochondrial health. Um, it depletes glutathione. It messes up succinate dehydrogenase, which is a crucial enzyme in the mitochondrial citric acid cycle. So it disrupts the, um, the body's ability to, uh, to process glucose through the, um, through the uh, mitochondria. I think the biggest problem could be PEPCK uh, which I talked about a lot in my book, very interesting molecule of phosphoenolpyruvate carboxykinase, which has a setup that exactly uh, matches what goes on in the enzyme that glyphosate famously disrupts in the plants, which is EPSB synthase. Just like EPSB synthase, it has highly conserved glycine at a place where uh, phosphate binds to the protein, and the phosphate is, a, is in a molecule called PEP. So both of those enzymes have that same setup. With, um, with these highly conserved glycines. And it's been shown in the case of EPSP synthase that if that glycine gets replaced by another amino acid, such as alanine, which is the most similar one to glycine, it becomes completely insensitive to glyphosate. So that's one of the arguments I use to say that that is the way in which it is messing up that protein is by replacing that glycine. So if the same thing happens to PEPCK, then this has enormous consequences, but one of them is fatty liver disease, which is also an epidemic. And fatty liver disease, um, well, what happens with PEPCK is essential for making glucose out of other things. So like from fats or from proteins, the, uh, the process that does that depends upon PEPCK. So when the liver uh, can't do that efficiently, um, if the glucose level in the blood gets too low, you can end up in a coma. So because your body wants to say, oh my God, the glucose is getting low. We need to make more. Let's make it using this PEPCK enzyme. Let's make more glucose, get it into the blood so that we'll be safe. And what I think is happening over time is that the system sort of changes the set point because it realizes there's a threat 
of glucose dropping too quickly. Like if you were exercising and burning up a lot of sugar and you can't depend upon this, this what's called gluconeogenesis system to make more glucose under an emergency condition, then your body kind of makes this decision to uh, keep the glucose levels high in the blood to protect you from the coma. Yeah, and that yeah. starts to be the precursor to diabetes. Right. Well, you, you've talked a bit, a little bit about the liver there. Um, you also talk in the book about how glyphosate disrupts the CYP enzymes in the liver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm most familiar with the CYP enzymes because of vitamin D, mm -hmm. uh, which I know you're into because you're in Hawaii. So um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> I love vitamin D. I love the yeah. sun. <laughs> yeah, you, you and I both. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how um, the CYP enzymes um, might be uh, disrupted by glyphosate and what that means for uh, these hormone-like molecules like vitamin D or anything involved, or any of these hormones involving cholesterol, So, which is you know, a lot of the important ones. I know, yeah. The CYP enzymes are, are quite uh, amazing. There's many of them and different ones do different things and they're all important. And all of them, I think, are suppressed by glyphosate. And the way that it suppresses all of them is because it suppresses an enzyme called CYP reductase. That's been shown experimentally. Cy cytochrome P450 reductase is the enzyme that takes the CYPs back to where they need to be in order to do their job. So there's like an oxidation reduction pathway where the CYP enzyme gets oxidized when it does its thing. And then CYP, it depends on CYP reductase to bring it back to the state that it can now do it again. So the, what happens is these CYP enzymes all get oxidized. They can't get brought back to their active state. So they all get suppressed that way. I think it's a general property um, because of uh, glyphosate disrupting that one enzyme, which is CYP reductase. And that enzyme has this perfect glyphosate susceptibility motif that I talked about, um, which makes it make sense to me that it would be suppressing it. It's also been shown experimentally. And so um, the CYP enzymes, for example, are essential for activating vitamin D. The vitamin D that you measure when you see how much vitamin D you have is the one that's made after the CYP enzyme in the liver has added this hydroxyl group. And so there's actually a CYP enzyme in the liver that does one step and then a CYP enzyme in the kidneys that does another step to make the 1 comma 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And that's the active form. But what you measure is the one in between. It's just the, the, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So it's a little bit complicated, but I actually think vitamin D's job is to test out all of these enzymes and make sure they're working correctly. I think it's a really cool system. I believe that these, these molecules that have this kind of hormone-like effect that they can signaling molecules like vitamin D that can have so many, so much impact on the behavior of the cells, they actually check out the systems to make sure they're working. And then if they are working, then they're good to go and they can tell the cells, yes, everything's great, be happy, you know? But when they can't make the vitamin D, that's a big red flag. Oh, if I can't make the vitamin, the hydroxy vitamin D, then I've got problems with CYP enzymes. That's gonna have huge consequences. So we have to do something different here because if the CYPs aren't working, we're in trouble. See what I'm saying? It's yeah, a signaling yeah. molecule um, that's letting the body know that those CYP enzymes are broken. And the CYPs, you know, they're critical for the bile acids. And there's a huge problem with bile acids today. And many, many people are having troubles with insufficient bile acids, inability to digest fats. And, um, and th those depend upon the CYP enzymes. They also are critical for de de detoxing many different fat soluble toxic chemicals. So many other chemicals become much more toxic because glyphosate is disrupting the enzymes that detoxify them. And of course, cholesterol also depends, cholesterol metabolism depends critically upon CYP enzymes as well. So yeah. you get all kinds of pro problems with various lipids um, with, uh, with the CYP enzymes being broken. Right. Well, it's, it's funny you, you mentioned that because your conversation with, um, I think it was Tom Cowan uh, talking ah, about uh -huh. um, why you don't, well, you wouldn't, well, first of all, you wouldn't recommend vitamin D supplementation. Right. And, um, also why it's probably not a good idea to go high dose vitamin mm -hmm. D supplementation because what you're doing is absolutely smashing those CYP enzymes all at once with all of this vitamin D. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that was, that was, it um, sort of distracts them from their main job. Right? Yeah. They're busy making, you know, Oh my God, all this vitamin D I have to do. And they have, they're trying to do all these other things at the same time. Vitamin D wants to be subtle, you know, just yep. go test and make sure it's okay. And now that's yeah. good. But yeah, I think so. I, I think, and I've actually always, I've been very strong on this position of not taking vitamin D supplements. I've never taken them myself. Yes. Um, 
I don't know that I'm right, but I have, I've, I wrote a long article for the Western Price Foundation uh, where I did research and, you know, used a lot of references that supported my position that, you know, you should be wary of that. Yeah, I actually, or that it's very different from sunlight. You know, people think, um, I say, I really love the sun. I, you, you really should get out in the sun. Yeah. And the person will answer, oh, yeah, I know vitamin D is important. I'm like, no, no, not vitamin D, the sun. You know? Yeah, <laughs> think, exactly. Because they think they can just take a pill. <laughs> Oh, well, it also links back to the, the whole water topic as well with the sun. It um, certainly does. The, yeah, the I mean, structured water as it grows enormously in response to sunlight. Yeah. Which is, you know. um, I wanted to talk about maybe some broader implications of the widespread use of, of glyphosate. You, you mentioned in the book that um, mm -hmm. these researchers were looking at uh, detecting glyphosate um, in, in a Petri dish and they had the control and then they had the, the glyphosate, um, the, uh, the, the one that they were going to test and they found glyphosate in both. Um, and you mentioned that the glyphosate is actually in the agar, the substrate that they use because they're using, um, you know, potentially glyphosate um, uh, contaminated um, substrates in the agar. Uh, you know, so many studies use um, plates like that and and potentially have been contaminated with glyphosate you know what what do you think the broader implications of having so many studies not taking the glyphosate right. contamination into account i think it's going on too with studies on fats you know they try these different things where they feed um, different kinds of fats they talk about saturated fat versus unsaturated you know vegetable oil and they'll do these experiments with people and, and try to judge, you know, the quality of these different fats. And unless they look at how much glyphosate is in the fat, they're going to get an answer they don't understand, you know, because it yeah. really, I think the critical thing is how much glyphosate is in the fat is what's going to make a huge difference in the, uh, in whether that's a healthy fat or not. It, it's, it's true for many experiments that are going on. I think people get contradictory results because, you know, someone does a rat study and they, and they, and they just say in these studies, they talk about a high fat diet, they give the rat a high fat diet often the paper doesn't say anything more than that. And I'm like, well, mm -hmm. gosh, I don't know which, where, they, where did they get that fat? Where is it from? Where are they using glyphosate? I ask all these questions and it's not there in, in the article because they don't think, they think it's irrelevant. They're not even thinking about it. You know, I think yeah. that's happening in lots of studies. And of course there was that one that was uh, supposedly proved. I don't know if you remember me writing about that in the book, the one that supposedly proved that glyphosate doesn't substitute yep. for glycine. Was that the one yeah. you were talking about? That's the about? one I because, was referring to. Yeah. yeah. Because that was so interesting because they, they started out with these cells, which were breast cancer cells and they had been maintained in culture for decades. So they were very old cells. And while they were maintained, they were probably being fed glyphosate all the while. So they probably had all kinds of glyphosate embedded all over their proteins. I suspect that both the treated group and the untreated control already had lots of glyphosate in their so-called tissues, right, in their proteins. And then when you grow them, um, they are going to break down the proteins that they have and make new proteins out of them. And they're going to free up glyphosate and put it into the new protein. So both sets of, um, of cells were doing that. And then meanwhile, they expose one set to glyphosate, but there are many conditions in which you can expose cells to glyphosate and it doesn't go in. You can make the conditions such that glyphosate doesn't get taken up by the cells. Whether they did that or not, I'm not sure, but it was certainly possible that the extra glyphosate they exposed them to did not get taken up, but the cells already had plenty of glyphosate inside them stuck inside proteins from their many years of being exposed to it. So it turned out both sets of cells were able to make proteins that showed up to have their, their method was really fun. And I was like excited about it because I think someone else could do that experiment if they were a chemist, do it with a better control, yeah. you know, yeah. to see because they found a number of proteins and, and beautifully they had the figure where they actually labeled the sequence. So you could look up the sequence and find out what the protein was, which I did. And I have in my appendix of my book, I actually list all these proteins. And they turn out to have many of them have what I call the glyphosate susceptibility motif, you know, so they're actually very nicely supporting um, my notions of where the glycine, glyphosate would show up. They found specific places in specific sequences in specific proteins that they reported on in that. Uh, and but both sides, the, uh, the, uh, there wasn't an, a noticeable difference between the treated group and the untreated group with respect to the amount 
which was why they then they said, well, all of it was noise, all of it was bogus, was what they concluded. But I concluded, well, both of them started out with the glyphosate and they just put it into those proteins. So we don't yet know who's right, but it's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, another one of your interests that seems to pop up in your in your um, journal articles and in the book is um, metals, whether that be, um, you know, uh, the metals from our, our diet that we need, like um, uh, magnesium, manganese, zinc, uh, and also the toxic metals like um, aluminium and, and other ones like that. Um, you've established a very interesting synergy between those and glyphosate because primarily, well, glyphosate was first used as a chelator to strip pipes of, of, of metals. Is that right? That's right. Yes, that yeah. was its first uh, application before they knew it was it could kill weeds. Yeah. So yeah and- what are the what are the implications of um, glyphosate's effect on these metals? Right. I think it's a really big problem, um, and both in the plants. And that's one of the things that Don Huber talked quite a bit about in his talk. And he actually showed experimentally. He had done. He, he was a plant expert, and he had done experiments where he had shown that when you expose the plants to the glyphosate in the soil it disrupts the soil microbiome and it interferes with the uptake of the minerals into the plant. And he showed dramatic drops in the amount of manganese and zinc and iron and sulfur actually. So all these things were being depleted. They weren't being taken up adequately by the plant with the glyphosate exposure uh, compared to the one that didn't have the glyphosate. So we're getting deficiencies in all these nutrients in our foods that if they're being grown in the presence of glyphosate even the GMO ones, you know, they, they're engineered to resist it, but that doesn't prevent the metals, the minerals from not coming in. So you get deficiencies in minerals in your food. And then the, maybe the worst of it is the microbiome because glyphosate severely um, interferes with, for example, the supply of manganese to the uh, lactobacillus and lactobacillus critically depend upon manganese. They really have an interesting metabolism where manganese is very, very important for their health. And lactobacillus is really the really, really important microbe in the infant gut. When the infant's first born, it's there to help them digest their milk. It has a lot of enzymes that support the digestion of milk and it gets clobbered by glyphosate. And it's been shown experimentally that lactobacillus and another one called bifidobacteria, which are really, really important um, beneficial microbes in your gut that, are, uh, that get usually grow in large amounts when the, after the baby starts eating when it's born both of them are very sensitive to glyphosate, whereas uh, uh, other species like Clostridia and Salmonella, which are you know, pathogens, they're much less sensitive to glyphosate. So you get um, overgrowth of these pathogens because the um, beneficial microbes are being killed off in part because they can't get enough manganese, but also because of course they're being uh, affected by that enzyme, EPSP synthase that they possess. So that's also messing them up. But it's both the enzyme uh, and uh, any other proteins, they have the same problem we do with respect to glyphosate substituting willy nilly in various proteins. So the, um, but the minerals, so the manganese was, in fact, Anthony and I wrote a whole paper on manganese. It was very interesting because we suspect that manganese ends up piling up in the liver um, because glyphosate is disrupting bioflow. And normally manganese binds to the bile acids and gets shipped back to the gut, bound to the bile acids. And then it gets taken up uh, through the, um, into the um, lymph system in the chylomicron. The chylomicron is like this giant, giant LDL particle that comes in. It's a way of getting fats into the system. And the chylomicron picks up those bile acids, picks up that manganese and distributes it throughout the circulation through that pathway. But that whole pathway gets clogged up because the bile acids aren't flowing. So the manganese accumulates in the liver and then it can become toxic if it's, if it's, if it accumulates. Manganese is, can be both toxic and deficient at the same time. So in the liver, it's piling up, it's becoming toxic. And what happens is the liver ships it up the vagus nerve to sort of disperse it and delivers it to the brain. But it ends up concentrated in the brainstem nuclei. And manganese in the brainstem nuclei is going to give you Parkinson's disease. So there's a well known um, Parkinsonism. There's a kind of a pseudo Parkinson's disease that happens with people who, with welders, because they're exposed to manganese, they breathe it. And the manganese travels along the olfactory nerve, gets into the brainstem and causes this Parkinsonian like symptom. So you can get the same thing via the vagus nerve from the liver because the manganese is not being properly distributed. That's just one example. The iron is all messed up as well. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in fact, all the minerals probably are getting 
disturbed, all the plus two cations, basically, which mm -hmm. there's a lot of them, zinc and manganese and iron and uh, cobalt. So, um, and, and of course these enzymes, these, these um, minerals are essential uh, catalysts for many different proteins, <clears throat> many different enzymes, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> losing my voice, <clears throat> but they, um, they can be toxic. So they, the body has developed really sophisticated systems for transporting them and delivering them safely. But glyphosate messes up those systems by grabbing hold of it. And then glyphosate drops it off when it gets into an acidic environment. So that's another thing that I worry about with aluminum getting carried by two glyphosate molecules that wrap up aluminum and make it lose its positive charge. Aluminum is usually plus three charge, but two glyphosate molecules wrapped around it will make it zero charge, make a small uncharged molecule that can easily get past the gut barrier, get past the brain barrier, and, and then unload it when you get into the um, more acidic environment of the terminal watershed of the circulation. Yeah, it, it's interesting <clears throat> you, you brought up uh, neurodegenerative diseases because it seems like um, the more and more research that's going on, the more it looks like these <clears throat> are diseases of protein misfolding. Mm -hmm. um, which yes. to me, when, when, you've got a, when you've got a molecule that's making it into the brain, uh, like glyphosate, that breaks um, structured water, the chance of protein misfolding goes up dramatically. Yes. Um, do you yes. think this is a potential mechanism that glyphosate's destroying the water in the brain and causing proteins to misfold? I absolutely do, yes. I think that's a very um, logical thing that could be going on. Mm. Yeah, right. Um, I'm conscious of your time. Um, so I'd like to just um, talk about maybe some um, some ways that we can sort of navigate through this issue because glyphosate's everywhere. Um, like foods, what kind of water, like, um, you know, what, what should we be doing to, to best mitigate the effects of, of glyphosate? Right. I mean, I think in the United States here, we have a lot of growing um, supply of certified organic food. I really appreciate that label. In theory, if you're being honest, certified organic means you're not using glyphosate at all in your in your um, in growing your foods. It doesn't mean your food is guaranteed to be glyphosate, you know, have no glyphosate because uh, it's in the rain, it's in the soil. I mean, it's, you know, it's in the air from the next door neighbor. So it's, it's really quite impossible to totally avoid it, but you can't use it. Uh, in organic. And so in fact, you know, measuring various people have measured glyphosate levels in foods and they have seen dramatically lower levels and sometimes zero in organic foods compared to non-organic. Uh, the GMO crops, so you certainly want to avoid the GMO crops because many of those, the most common GMO is the genetic engineering to resist glyphosate so that you can just spray the glyphosate all over the crop. Unfortunately, there are many crops that are sprayed with glyphosate right before harvest as a desiccant and they are and they're non-GMO. So non-GMO is not a good enough label. When you buy your food, you need to look for certified organic. In fact, some of the highest levels have shown up in the crops that are sprayed right before harvest. And that includes wheat and barley and oats and, and chickpeas and garbanzo beans and, and various um, nut seeds. So many different foods are being sprayed right before harvest and they are getting very high levels of glyphosate. In fact, I think uh, gluten intolerance is the epidemic in gluten intolerance, I think, is due to glyphosate contamination in the wheat. And that's another paper that Anthony and I wrote together was mm -hmm. on the topic of gluten intolerance. Yeah, so it seems like a really good idea would be all of your um, grains and legumes uh, make sure that they are certified organic, certified organic. Um, biodynamic yes. if possible. Um, and, right, right. <laughs> and um, how about water? Because Glyphosate's a tiny, tiny molecule. Right. Is reverse osmosis good enough? Well, reverse osmosis is really the right thing to do to try to get rid of the glyphosate in the water. Of course, that also strips out all the minerals. So mm -hmm. you need to put them back in, yeah. unfortunately, after, or else you'll have mineral deficiency because water is a good source of minerals. Yeah. So it's kind of unfortunate that you have to do that. Yeah. Um, but it is, I think, I don't know that other methods of, you know, regular filters that just, uh, you know, don't work the ones that just uh, that are not based on reverse osmosis yeah. do not necessarily remove the glyphosate um, and of course you can have your water tested uh, to see if it does have glyphosate in it another problem i think is the air and this is one that i've only started worrying about in the last couple of years uh, when i became aware of glyphosate as a possible contaminant in the air due to biofuels and that's something i've been talking about lately 
I'm quite concerned that um, we may be releasing glyphosate into the air from fuels that are uh, biofuels that are derived from these these crops um, being burned in the um, in the vehicles and then glyphosate evaporating before it reaches combustion. And um, you know, it's something I just sort of made up theoretically. I didn't have proof, but it turns out there's a paper that was just recently published out of Brazil where they looked at nanoparticles in the air and they looked in the regions where the agricultural regions where glyphosate was being used and they looked in the city and they actually found glyphosate in both places and they found higher levels in the nanoparticles in the city compared to the agricultural fields. They were surprised. But I think it's because Brazil is a leader in the biofuel industry. They make bioethanol out of uh, sugarcane that's sprayed right before harvest with glyphosate. And then the, they have these trucks that are designed, the engine is designed to run on very high levels of bioethanol. So I think they they're have a problem with uh, glyphosate in the air in the city. And in fact, Anthony's been testing, well, he's been testing rain and he had B-collect samples of rain here in Hawaii at my home in Winchester, Massachusetts, and in my office at MIT, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And the one in Cambridge came out positive for glyphosate. The other two were negative. Right. So, oh, that's, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot we need to look into and we certainly need to stop spraying the stuff um, as soon as possible. Um, yes, I guess, it's really quite difficult to figure out how to navigate this world, especially yeah. if you live in the United States where we have 4% of the world's population and we consume 20% of the world's glyphosate. So we have a much higher burden per person than other countries here. And I don't know what it's like in Australia, but I know you guys use quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, the, the trend is usually we follow whatever you guys do. <laughs> yeah. It's a bad idea. <laughs> it is a bad, a bad idea. Role model. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, I'll let you go because I know you've probably got um, lots of things to be doing. Um, hopefully we can do this again, though, because I, I've learned so much and it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, it's been great. I appreciate it. I would encourage everyone to get the yes. book. Yes, <laughs> I have um, it here too. <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, it's it's written extremely well. And, um, yeah, it's, it's not – it's written enough for the layman that I guess anyone can read it and really um, – take take away enough to help themselves so yeah i worked hard to, to simplify it, it was yeah no you, you did a fantastic job <laughs> yeah you did a great job thank you all right stephanie i hope you have a wonderful day i'll um, hopefully talk to you soon yes thank you so much all right good talking care. to you bye-bye okay. thanks so much for listening to my conversation with stephanie i really hope you enjoyed it as much as i did if you'd like to keep up to date with everything I'm doing, you can follow me on social media platforms using at Richie Flow Nutrition, or you can access all of my material through my website, richieflownutrition.com. I've got a lot of incredible guests coming up, so stay tuned for another episode of the Richie Flow podcast. Cheers.